Good morning, and you're very welcome to this, to this morning's signpost webinar. My name is Pat Murphy, Head of Environment Knowledge Transfer with Chagask, and the series is brought to you in, in conjunction with National Rural Net Network, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Uh, this morning, we're coming to you from uh, Johnstown Castle, or uh, a, a couple of us are anyway, and we're delighted uh, to be joined by uh, Catherine Keena, who will help us with the, the questions. And Edward Byrne. Edward, if you want to put on your video, yeah. Uh, Edward is a, a marine engineer by, by training, spent a number of years in that world, and, and then uh, began a, a business supplying, uh, and uh, I suppose, materials to uh, support the renovation and, and maintenance of uh, heritage buildings, uh, and is in more recent times involved in the supply of, of lime, uh, for uh, the, the uh, I suppose the maintenance of, of uh, uh, heritage buildings. You're very welcome, Edward. If you just turn off your mute there. Good morning and thank you. Uh, and we're also joined this morning by uh, uh, Dr. David Wall here in Johnstown Castle. David, you're going to talk to us just for a minute about uh, an open day that's going to be taking place here in Johnstown Castle in the next couple of weeks. Good morning all, good morning Pat, um, and thanks for the introduction and the opportunity, I suppose, to um, to promote, I suppose, our open day. Um, so the open day will take place um, Tuesday week, so the 30th of August, Tuesday the 30th of August, and the gates will open at 10 a.m. and close at 3 or 4 a.m. or 4 p.m. as the... the, the um, uh, as people pass through the open day. So there'll be plenty to see here. And um, as you're all aware, there's many challenges out there uh, currently for farming um, on, I suppose, the input side, but also on the environmental side. Uh, so um, we will have all the technologies that are ready for adoption on farms today. And those uh, technologies that are in the pipeline uh, for tomorrow will be available. Um, the big challenge, I suppose, in, in recent times has been uh, the greenhouse gas and the uh, emissions reductions target for the sector. So we will have plans and technologies there that farmers can adopt on their farms to prepare themselves for uh, reducing emissions into the future. Things like biodiversity, how to prepare your farm and, and enhance the biodiversity value and the nature value of your farm while still making a profit using your nutrients better uh, managing your swords and your animals. So uh, those technologies will be front and center in the open day. Um, there'll be much more besides, I suppose, the uh, latest work there on multi-species swords on uh, the dairy herd, also the winter milk for those involved in, in liquid milk. Um, we will have dairy cow nutrition uh, for the, the winter milk herd and the dairy beef systems also on multi-species swords there, uh, come and find out what the latest uh, information is in terms of those systems. The signpost program will be peppered throughout the, the, the open day and uh, obviously come and find out also about the new acre scheme. So it's, it's fair to say, I think anybody who's either interested from, from uh, the perspective of what's the latest research we're doing, what are the technologies that are, are ready to be implemented on farm, the advisory support that's there in terms of doing it, and then seeing the systems that, that, that are in, uh, in place and, and looking at best practice here on the farm in Johnstown Castle will all be on display. That's it, that's it, Pat. And, and look at it, it'll be a day for all, uh, all farmer enterprises. Uh, although grassland focused, there'll still be something there for a tillage farmer. Uh, we're in a tillage area, so uh, they're more than welcome to come. And obviously uh, the schools are, are, are back that week, but if there is uh, students there, even students going back to secondary school transition year, or prospective students going back to third level, um, the farmers of the future, they need to get informed and, and are more than welcome to come to the open day. And just to remind us of the date again. The date is Tuesday the 30th of August and the gates will open at 10 a.m. Okay, that's great. Thank, th thanks for that. And again, what we will try to do is for all the people who have signed up for the, the uh, signpost webinar, we'll send you out a flyer just to invite you to it. 
it, we see it very much as a, a continuation of the, of the work we're trying to do with this webinar. It's, it's a bringing of a lot of, of what we've been trying to do over the last uh, couple of years together into one uh, big presentation. So uh, good luck with that, David, and we'll see you on the day. Thanks, and hope, hopefully we'll see everybody there. Okay, back to you, Edward. And uh, again, you might just uh, uh, describe some of the, the, the work you do in relation to uh, all uh, our uh, buildings and heritage buildings. And, and I suppose just to mention the reason or the main reason you're here is we're in Heritage Week, uh, where we're trying to focus on I suppose, built and, and natural heritage in, in, in our rural environments. And I think you play a major role in, in relation to supporting that. Good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, Edward Byrne is my name. Um, I run the traditional line company, owned and run with my wife, traditional line company. I started life as a marine engineer. Uh, and then when my wife and I settled down, I gave it up and it was, it was salvaging old buildings with a view to actually building a traditional building myself or, and or restoring one. And uh, I just stayed at that and expanded that in 1980. And we've been at it ever since. And we then did our own house with lime in about 84 and we have been selling lime but it became our major our major uh, sale in the late 90s when we got the agency for french hydraulic lime because okay. there was no maker of hydraulic lime in britain or ireland at that stage so that's and i think you, you've mentioned to us you would have seen i suppose a renewed interest through the, the rep scheme uh, uh, in, in relation to traditional yes, the, and that yeah and that's a very good that's actually one of the best schemes in that is the one that's administered reps and that where, where farm buildings which is you know for uh, small farm buildings is one of the best better of the schemes because it, it involves local builders local tech you know because in major conservation it tends to be bigger firms you know international or not national mm -hmm. uh, tendering and that but the local ones are by far the best okay, because okay. That, that's what you see when you're so you you have a presentation with us if you're yeah, ready yeah, to go with that yeah. if you want to share your presentation yeah. and i think it's very pictorial and it'll give a, a very nice uh, yeah. uh view of some of the work that's that's been done around the country sorry um, i'm not very good at this so I'm gonna... okay and if you go to full screen yeah. share there yeah perfect okay good morning and um no my this is a, a, a presentation that originally done for i think heritage week for carlo county council years ago and basically most of the buildings in this are within about an 80 mile radius of carlo stroke you know carlo kildare the east coast but it's it's, it's, based, but it's just to show that the variety of building materials that were used and where they were used um and but my real interest is in traditional building and methods i'm typecast into line i'm like the, the actor who has to play the good cop or the bad cop I, people tend to think now of me as lime but the reality is lime is a fairly boring subject while building materials are very interesting because of their origins etc and their the reasons anyway just a lot of lot of mistakes a lot of people think of, of tradition be for custom but vernacular the ordinary building materials of a district or country conserve is to keep from harm conservation means minimal intervention people talk about conservation but they don't understand it's totally different from restoration which is bring back the original state or refurbish you know, a lot of people who tell you that they're doing conservation restoration they're actually just refurbishing the building it's not quite the same thing and then you have get discovered of protected building well i'm sure this man thinks he's living in a protected structure but it's not a protected structure as in according to the government well this again this building uh, it looks like a protected structure but i know this man covered it in topsoil to stop people robbing the bricks slightly different form of protection while this is a genuine protected structure now made last in 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 um, wexford where they put a shed over it because the roof was about to collapse and it was very practical that by putting the shed over it they could work away regardless of the weather prevent they could actually hang the remaining amount of the roof until they study the building which is dangerous inside so they they protected and then this they sold the shed off so it was a very practical move um to to preserve this and that's the finished building now they the, on the right hand of the screen it looks as if there's damage to the corner that's not that's the wall of the garden which was hadn't been restored at that stage it was made less in 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 the, and then this is a building that should have been protected but while they're all fighting over it this is what happened 
So you see, protection doesn't help. The building was protected, but nobody did anything about it. Here's a man who was trying to protect his building by sticking any bit of a slate in to keep it, but gave up in the end. Another protected, uh, but his protection failed in the end. It's now gone, this building. Uh, this is just to illustrate how Ireland, the, the bottom half and the top half of Ireland are basically uh, granite and sandstones and the centre, the blue section, the light blue section, that's the limestone, which is the centre of Ireland. So, uh, And in fact, you know, you hear people saying they got matching stone from Cavan or somewhere to match. The reality is that's no more. In fact, if you really wanted matching stone, you'd probably be better to go to Spain because the bottom half of Ireland has more in common with, in geo geological terms with Spain and the top half with Scandinavia. But yet, even, you know, just because it just shows how the, the materials are not necessarily, the, they're local now, but they weren't local billions of years ago. And um, um, at the, so this, you see, people talk about every slate in Ireland is described as a blue Bangor slate. Well, that's Bangor was there. And of course, they were shipped. Shipping was much easier. It was easier to bring stuff across the Irish Sea than it was to bring it 30 or 40 miles inland until the advent of the canals, which changed everything. And there are thousands of different, uh, or not thousands, there's a lot of different slates and everybody described it as Bangor, but they're not. If they came out of Bangor, the port of Bangor, they were quarried in uh, Blano Festiniog and the mountain there. And if they came through Bangor, they were purpley blue. And, they were, and if they came from the other side of the mountain, they were gray blue and they were called Port Maddox. But they, they both came from the same mountain, just literally hundreds of yards apart. These are Glass Lacken slate common around Bunclody, it's just outside Bunclody, the last lack of slate, quite small, beautiful little slate, but very difficult, well, uh, very slow to work with. These are a Henny slate from the slate quarries of Henny, where the famous high cross is down near there, just below Kil between Kilmagany and, and Carrick and Shore. These are Kilcavan slate, these quarries were opened by the Fitzwilliam estate, by the, by, um, Lord Fitzwilliam, who had at between 70 and 90,000 acres in the Wicklow, Carlow, North Wexford area. And there, they had a modest house in England, Wood, went out, Wort Wood House. It was only 690 foot long. It's the longest facade of any building in, in Europe, the reckon, of a private house. It's actually longer than Buckingham Palace. These are Kil, uh, Kilcavan states again. That's just outside Carnew. Or the, this, this roof is outside Shalala, but the quarry was just outside Carnew. These are Henny slates on our own house. These actually came off the church in, in Dunhamagan when it was demolished and we used them on our own house. These are Westmoreland green slates. Now, these are on a concrete built house in the west of Ireland in 1911, which is still And they were also used in Christchurch Cathedral, the most expensive slate in the world that now are still are, I think, Westmoreland greens. Uh, these are Valencia Slate. Now, Valencia Slate was used on the House of Parliament and the shelves of the British Library as a sawn slate. And I possibly, I think, originally might have been used in the White House, which was designed by an Irish architect called Hoban from just outside Callan. Uh, these are a modern uh, Spanish slate. You see, there's no life to these. Look, you look at the roof and it's dead. There's nothing wrong as a roof, but it, they just have no life while the Traditional states have a lovely life to make a building look completely different. Now, these states in Gishel, as you can see, these all came from the same quarry because different beds or layers of the quarry were different. So you've got this polychromatic slate, slating, coloured slate put in to emphasise. You get it more common on church roofs than on this. Uh, this is called Scotch slating, an economical way of slating and giving you ventilation because generally slate roofs were actually torched or parged on the back with had lime mortar put on the back which was the original for want of a better word breathable felt shall we say a very good idea but very difficult to do in modern building and these uh, these are killaloo slates on a new building near clonigal in county carlo oh so it's repeating somehow and this is weather slating and the important thing to remember about weather slating if you ever re redo it, it's the states are turned upside down it's the one they're turned the opposite way than you would put them on a roof this is a repaired um, side of a building in um, Castle Comer, and you can see where the repaired estates are not quite, but they'll weather into the same colour. They're held on by with lime mortar and a nail, 
driven into them. And they, you often got these decorative elements in this is, is in Clonmel and the key in Clonmel. And then, of course, you had thatched roofs and the variety of types of thatch were more or less local to districts. This, this, the methods of thatching, I think, and of course, the material used everything from flax to straw to um, reed. And depending. reed wasn't as common around here. Well, it was on the Wexford down where, where you had reed beds. These are just thatched roofs around Ireland or within, again, within an area. That's actually up in Cavan, Gartland's pub. That's in Tipperary, that one there, the round, rounded gable was quite common in Tipperary. That's a Donegal thatch, I think, actually, but they, they're completely rounded roof. And this is the inside, and this use hedgerow timber, just split and put up and scrawled in from the, <clears throat> the top of a bog or top of the thing. Was a sod was put on top, and then the, the thatch was laid straight on top of that. This is in Kilkenny. This is Jimmy Lenehan. He's a well-known thatcher. Uh, his own house in Kilkenny. And this style of roofing really wouldn't have been common in Ireland. These are Bridgewater tiles. Again, you see, because it was easier to ship stuff from Bridgewater in Somerset to down to Bristol Channel, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> and then these are Brid what's called known as Bridgewater double Roman Bridgewater tiles. They're called. And this is a gate lodge on the with the flat uh, little pan tiles. Uh, it's a gate lodge on the Fitzwilliam estate. Uh, it's between Shalala and Tinnehealy, a bit unknown because it's down the side road. And that's a traditional, that gate is the traditional um, Fitzwilliam uh, Colatin gate, which has round there, these bars are round timber. They're not, they're not square, they're actually round timber. Very traditional, lovely gate, beautiful gate. They used to be everywhere on the Carlton estate. That's on the Lansdowne estate. They're um, Bridgewater again, but they're slightly different. These again, and these tiles are zigzag pattern. They're not rounded or very, it doesn't show up very well in the photograph. And that's in Strad Valley, County Leash. Uh, that's, that's an original corrugated iron roof. There is no evidence that building ever had. So that probably dates from 1860s. Uh, there's no evidence that that building ever had any earlier roof on it. The roof looks to have been made for the original building, which is actually in our own farmyard, our own, where we live. There's the uh, sheet um, iron used in the same manner as you'd use lead and roll top on it. Again, another better of doing that. And they, they, um, it was quite common around Milford, the estate in Milford, the Alexander's, their main house was done in this and all of the gate lodges and all the estate lodges were done this way as well. Uh, typical uh, on a clay building, clay building, just common. That's in Kildare. That's up uh, Wicklow. Again, modern use of galvanized iron on the building. And this is an early, a very early hay shed or uh, barn. And you can see the date on it there, uh, 1889. And use and railway tracks. This in, was it out near Walls Lock in Kilkenny. And that's Orglin in Orglin, uh, that, that the mansard roof it was on Orglin standing on cast iron pillars. And they, I don't know whether you can see in the picture the, the stress beams um, with the, on the, under the floor with the, the tension, tension rods on them. And just some other galvanized. And then Port Law, you see, was at Malcolmson's. And they, they um, this is a view of Port Law where the buildings, all the buildings, the original building, had rounded roofs and were covered in felt with, using a type of Belfast, what they call a Belfast truss, with their felt. And the Malcolmsons were very prominent uh, mills in, in Port Law. Uh, and they were into ship, ship building and ship owning as well in Waterford. And of course, you're always told that uh, the big, in building, they used to put the big stones at the bottom. Well, anybody who knows Boris, the Boris men don't do anything the same as anybody else, as everybody knows from the fair day in Boris. But anyway, see how the big, the very, and there's some of the stones are three foot across on, in that wall in Boris. This is tri traditional Carlo walling, fancy used with split granite. The, the Carlo farmers or Carlo um, um, the stone masons had a reputation of being able to split granite uh, better than anybody else. And they, they, they split up the 10 and 12 foot lengths of granite. And that's the wall of the Browns Hill estate, which is, if you talk to people, they'll tell you it's a granite wall or a limestone wall, because it starts as limestone at one end near Carlow. And by the time it gets out, 
to Benny Kerry, it's all it's all granite. And in the middle, it's mixed stone. It, they used what was available. That's a Wexford wall, typical Wexford wall down below Bun Clody, between Bun Clody and Enniscorthy, that'd be very common. And then once the once the railways came, it really the, the canals first, and then the railways changed. So that's the Thomastown railway station. You see, it was easy bring materials because the trains were coming anyway. And in fact, you could buy gate posts for 50 shill shillings a pair. Uh, delivered to practically any railway station in Ireland from some of the railways. And they were mainly limestone or granite gate posts, single piece sent sent by by, uh, by rail. You could have them delivered by rail. And that's where you get all these one piece granite or, or limestone posts. And that's a chimney up uh, near Wolf Hill or not quite went out to Swan. But that's not, not what people think. It's a ventilation shaft for a mine underneath, you see. It's not actually... The idea was then if the if the ventilation was bad, they lit a fire at the bottom, but only to draw the, the air up through the mine. It wasn't a chimney for an industrial purpose. It was actually a ventilation shaft for a mine. And 50, 50, I give 50 euro to anybody who can tell me what this building, well, and, and this would be difficult to avoid, what, what stone this building is built from. It's actually early concrete block, the Carnegie Library in, in uh, Kilkenny. It's built from in early form concrete block and that's the that's one of the first concrete bridges in ireland and they tested that bridge i have a photograph somewhere which i couldn't find the time for this where they tested it by driving two steam engines in opposite directions having loaded the bridge already with two fully loaded trailers behind the steam engines across it on the bit it's just under kilkenny castle the main bridge in Kenny. it's one of the first concrete build, build bridges in ireland and uh, this is this is lismore castle and why i show this is to show that you could spend the rest of your life looking for matching stone to repair this. And in fact, you won't find it because the stone for the windows dressings were brought in by the bachelor Duke um, from his parties in Derbyshire. And he even more or less ca canalized or made a river into a canal to get the stone up there. And it's one of the few places in the world or in Ireland, sorry, that you get Burlington blue slates because his second title is Lord Burlington. And he owned the quarries, so they're used up along the Blackwater Valley on his houses, but you won't get them anywhere else. Kylemore Abbey, built of granite, imported from Dawkey. Strange to seem, even though that part of the world is full of full of uh, of stone, but they brought in granite from Dawkey to to Wicklow to build there. And uh, these are some of the bricks you find. These are these are bricks I found when in our salvage business. Kept one of them. All different bricks. Note the one there with the big paw print in it. I wouldn't like to have met that dog on a dark night with a paw that big. And there, and those those bricks there are not really bricks. They're actually early form of of cavity wall tie. And they're the drying floor from a malting malt drying. There. They they were the floors from malt drying floor. They lit a fire underneath the steam went up the malting floor, the air went up to dry the corn. The door of brick, just an example of it's still there. This is how bricks were made in clamps, just traditionally just made in clamps. That's an early Georgian brick house in Carlow. You wouldn't expect brick in Carlow. That's a Victorian brick house just outside Nace. And that's stone um, oh, uh, be, between near Corriclo, actually, that, that building. Um, and uh, that, that, that was the Hempenstall family where the famous thing is here lie the bones of Hempenstall judge, jury, hangman, gallows, rope and all he used to hang people over his shoulder during 1798 and note that the traditional mortars contain very big pieces of aggregate this is one of the problems we have now is getting an aggregate to look right in a repair because you have to add you can't get really coarse sands as they originally used Carlo Railway Station, which if you go to it now, looks like a yellow brick railway station, but in fact, originally would have, as you can see, would have been, the bricks would have been colored. They were actually covered with a coloring to make them look, it would have looked like a red brick railway station originally, and more something more like this, where it was emphasized, but and this is what would have looked like originally, even though the background bricks are yellow, because it was fashionable to have with yellow brick, red brick were 
or expensive. So this is called tuck pointing, faster tuck or wigging pointing, depending on the type of way it's done. Tuck pointing is more common in Britain. Faster tuck or wigging is more common in, in Ireland. This is how it's done. We line out and say, you know, finished product. This is how you shouldn't point uh, a brick building. But anyway, that's the inside of a dovecote done with brick in, in up in uh, County Kenny. It's near Ballyragget. And here is the correct use of concrete. It uses a springer. This is about a 1911 building where they actually, where they would have normally used a piece of stone made effectively a, a springer and of course the, the sill is early concrete because one of the first concrete or uh, cement works in Ireland was actually in Wexford. A um, ship captain's house, a Swedish ship captain's house in Wexford with a white brick, with a tile, imported tile and all done with pitch pine throughout. In the... This is cold stone, this is halfway, I can't remember the name of the churchyard but it's about halfway between Enniscorthy and Wexford on the on the west side of the, of the Slaney, in memorial in a thing, it's called Code Stone. It's actually a baked, really a type of terracotta, but it was a patent by Mrs. Code called Code Stone. This is Roman cement used in the um, Roman cement used uh, as decoration. That's on Burris House. Uh, it, um, it it was invented by the Reverend Parker in 1790s, and he. It looked the same color as the Roman mortar they were finding in Roman remains of Britain. So he called it Roman cement for that, but it, it sets in three to five minutes, a quick setting natural cement. It actually is the ultimate in hydraulic line. That's what it actually is. It's a, the ultimate in the hydraulic line. These are cornerstones made of it in Carlow. Pier in Clahaman, Pier in Dublin, in Monkstown in Dublin. It's always the color of chocolate except for white light brown to dark brown to quite reddish brown. That's the inside of a bread oven in, in Capaquin, Barron's Bakery. I'd recommend anybody to go there for their bread. It's absolutely delicious. And this is what happens when you use cement to point the building. You can see the salts coming out. The salts have destroyed the face of the brick. The pointing in this building probably had failed and somebody said, I'll solve that. I'll put a good, strong, hard cement. And of course, it's ruined the brick. It's easy to repoint the building. Not easy, but it's a lot easier than to replace all those brick. That was a public toilet, just as you go into rat mines or rat, rat mines, more or less in Dublin. Temple Oak, actually, yes, rat mines. And this is what happens when you use cement on a building again, the decay. This building was pointed, was plastered from there up to there. And uh, the salt then from the cement capillary rise up. It was plastered to stop the rising damp. All it did was drive it higher up. And of course, the salts then damage the stone. This is the other side of that building where the cement is still on it and where the damage is done to the stone by what they thought was doing the right thing. In fact, it was completely dead. Kyle Moore Abbey, the church, looks grand. You go up close and you see the leaching, which means that water is getting in and can't get back out or just coming out through the thing. Inside then, all the salts appearing inside because it's been pointed with a hard, uh, impervious cement material. And you've got this, and this is what you have. The salts then all appearing inside. The mortar on the outside should be sacrificial and and uh, breathable, more important. And of course, this phenomena of the, here's it by the concrete blocks because the leaching, when, when ordinary cement sets, Portland cement sets, it releases up between seven and 13% lime in the setting action. So this is why you get this leaching of, even from concrete block or that of lime, which people blame on the lime mortar, but it's happened to these blocks and they never saw a bit of lime mortar. A damp in a building where the, the, the material to the right is, is a coat of cement was put on. And when we not hacked the plaster off, it was actually physically damp. And the other side of the wall was physically damp just because of trapped moisture. There's no such thing, strictly speaking, as rising damp. It's trapped moisture. If you allow the moisture, get away on the outside. It won't interfere with you. This is a, the phenomenon you get on chimneys where the... The chimney you can see has got slightly banana shaped. The reason being the salts from the burning of the of the sulfates, coal, kind of sulfur. The salts are coming out through the chimney. On one side, they get washed away by the rain on the prevailing wind and rain side. On the other side, or not, they stay there and they expand and they push. They make the mortar expand and push the chimney over. And you can see them quite banana shaped in some cases. 
it's all caused by 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 the the salts from from the, the fireplaces. Uh, my daughter, who studied veterinary in Budapest and is a vet, uh, equine vet here in Ireland now, uh, she sent me this uh, about Venice. She went to visit Venice when she was in, studying in Budapest, but it doesn't tell you on this poster the same company supplied the mortar that caused the dampness. But anyway, now this is where into flexibility of lime mortars. I'm probably starting to go over time here, but flexibility of lime mortars. If you could see where that's in the next slide, you can see where it's dropped. And the brick has all flexed. It's curved down, including the sill is curved the other way because the mortar is flexible. If that was a cement mortar, there would have been a major crack. And there's other examples of, of the difficult to see in, the, in a small slide, but where the, the building has, has settled and the lime mortar accommodates the settlement. You see. The, now, all the, all the materials in this shopping basket or trolley contain lime. They all contain lime, including the trolley, because it takes a ton, virtually a ton of lime to make a ton of steel. The average car has a ton of lime in it in some way. Or other. So the biggest user of lime is actually the steel industry is one of the biggest users, and also the scrubbing of, of exhaust gases from, uh, from power stations, now coal-fired power stations not conservation, restoration, or building. That's an old lime kiln, that's in Wexford. They're the original Clogrenin lime kilns. This is a modern Clogrenin lime called a Mertz kiln. It works on the principle of, as one is burning, the other is heating up, and then the change, the change over, and the empty one starts. And this is the sugar factory kiln, which is still there. And the sugar factory had the potential to, they made up 100 tonnes of lime a day. It's one was one of the largest producer in Ireland when it was there. Of course, they had another kiln in, in, in uh, Mallow and another one in Chum, but this one left in Carlo is still standing, actually, this kiln. That's the inside of a lime kiln while burning. You shouldn't by right see the burning because you're losing heat. The most important thing is to conserve the heat because it's more fuel. But this is just where the moving down. These are the different classes of lime used and what their breathability, but how to make up lime mortar. To, they, Richard Neve wrote about how to make a proper lime mortar. This is that method being practiced on site in a demonstration with a man called Henry Thompson on the left and myself on the right. This is the mortar being mixed up. This is George O'Malley making up a lime putty, which is used for skimming plasters and stuff like that inside. And uh, this is a, <clears throat> a ladies' island in Wexford. We, supplied the lime to restore the church behind, but the, the tower is lying over and that proves that it was a hydraulic lime because non-hydraulic lime has no tensile strength. So it would have come down if it wasn't. This is one of the earliest uh, pieces on bridges um, done by Semple. Semple was an expert on hydraulic lime in Ireland and he built this bridge, Essex Bridge in Dublin and wrote extensively on it. Uh, there's a, a few examples of lime mortars where they're used, old lime mortars. Then the different limes you get are white rhino, which is non hydraulic lime, hydrated lime, but non hydraulic, and used for like lime washing all these buildings and used, well, that building and the inside of it. That's the building before and after. Use, use can be used in inside work um, on ceilings. And then the next is non hydraulic lime and NHL2. NHL2 means natural hydraulic lime 2. And 2 is its setting strength in a standard concrete test. It has to set to 2 newtons in 28 days to qualify. This is also used, that's been used in a ceiling in our own house on Latin plaster. That's again, the, the corn has been run in it in our own house. It's a straw bale building up in, in uh, Sligo, which has a coat of clay on first to level the straw out and then plaster with a hydraulic lime. That's the uh, adjutant general's house at Kilmainham, or yeah, at Kilmainham at the Royal Hospital, done with an NHL2. The Weaver's Cottage in Clonigal, they have glass lacken, a mixture of glass lacken and Killaloo slates or, or a Henny slates on it and the building itself done. Then the next is the normal it's a bit, it would be the normal lime use. It, NHL 3.5 would be, it's the equivalent of the Toyota Corolla, the high-ace van of lime. It'll do just about anything if correctly used. 
that's our training center we built with that's all done with nhl 3.5 that's a new building done with it an old building done with it and this is a building that was done down in clare was featured in country living magazine that's the finished building completely derelict since 1860 brought back and interesting enough these heating bills even though there's no insulation in the walls are, and everything is not any more than a normal house that's our own house when we started it was a full-size tree grown in the middle we two and a half walls and that's it now this is there the henny slates on the roof that's uh oh that's one of the lodges up on the wicklow it's up on the wicklow gap i can't remember the name of it now that was a dovecote to the ratvarnham castle on with lime sprayed on it was sprayed on lime lime that's in the war now that's the sorry the the land league house that's in wing gap there's a church on where it's meant it was very damp and they wanted to try it done in lime it's try and then the strongest lime is an nhl5 uh, we used generally below ground level or above parapet level provided the host masonry is strong enough to take it and it's the best for there best like lighthouses that's a lime concrete floor no need for expansion joints. Lime is very flexible, so there's no need for an expansion joint. You can you can build a stone wall from here to America, no expansion joints. If you use lime, that's a castle. And you get this patching, which is the proves that the lime is working because it's pulling the moisture out of the wall, which leaves the stain. But the stain usually wears off after a couple of years. This is a castle on the oh just outside Galway, um, on the on the Headford Road. This is the lime washes then. This is pink lime wash. That's at the Ballymaloo Cookery School. That's pink lime wash on a house, in an old house in Wicklow. Quite, quite uh, red was and pink were, were reddish. So they were, were quite common in, in this area and in East Cork in particular. While Limerick was very much yellow. That's actually in Valley Tor. Um, there, that's in a, that's in, on the Waterford. Kilkenny border. Again, you see, often there was yellow lime wash. It was that whatever pigment was available locally in most of the pigments. That's in. That's actually in Limerick, Kilmallock. Um, that's in Wicklow, Waterford uh, Cathedral. Jeremy Irons Castle. He was our biggest client ever for lime in one go. Twenty-seven tons of lime he took to do that castle. And this is, these are where the pigments are sourced. These are from the mines in Avoca. You can still get the pigments from there. Well, you can't, I mean, still get them, but they're not commercially available. These are modern, modern we use commercially available pigments now. It's by a full range of pigments. That's the drawing room of our own house that's done with a mineral paint, which you saw earlier. And let's just use this to illustrate that in Scotland, the roofers actually did the rough cast as a calling or dashing of houses, not not plasters, because it was considered a protective layer to keep the rain out, the same as a roof. That's a hood fireplace. And in the next slide, it'll show you that it's actually made with wattle and daub. You can see what I'm pointing at. Right? See, it's actually wattle and daub and clay, then covered with a lime wash. And sometimes they were just made out of timber boards, lime washed, heavily lime washed to, to make them, relatively speaking, fireproof. And this is a well furnished drawing room in Kilkenny. <laughs> on the road in Kilkenny one day. Uh, and a lot of this information and that will come from Mr. Practical Geology and Architecture of Ireland. This is Mr. Wilkinson. I think I'm going over my time at this stage. Um, what a very good thing. He was the architect for the, for the, the workhouses extremely well built and uh, a lot of the information is in these anybody wants to get that just run through so uh, was in kenny before and after before and after again how timber is done correctly done uh, sawn for the best, best results this is the job we did where we hand worked square this by log by hand and built a building that's my bald head there i had had still got some black hair either side, but now it's all gone grey. A couple of years ago, proper access to do it, pit sawing, and this is a job we we did a training course for the for the OPW in Kilkenny. And I think that's we've reached the end.
Thank God, says everybody. I know. I, I think absolutely fascinating. I think people are just amazed by the amount of, of, of information. And I suppose one of the things that strikes me is we probably don't know how much we don't know in, in, in relation to this whole area. And I suppose no more than uh, the, the, the whole skill around thatching, the whole skill set around knowing what to do in, in relation to mortars and limes. Uh, it's it's um, an old skill and probably one that needs to be brought back into uh, into prominence if we're going to effectively. Uh, uh, I have to use the right word now that you've described all the words, but uh, uh, renovate or or maintain uh, yep. the, the building stock that we have. You might stop Edward. sharing there as well, uh, Edward. Sorry, what do I? Oh, I'm sorry, not again. Uh, interesting. The the. the the man Semple who built the bridge, the, the bridge in Dublin, said made a, probably the best statement ever made about lime. He said the only water you should add to lime is the sweat of the workmen. In other words, plenty of mixing. And I mean, people give out now and say, "Oh, I'm not doing that." You don't have to. Mr. Briggs and Stratton or Mr. Honda will do the sweating for you. Just go off and leave the thing in the mixer for longer. That's all. That's all. In fact, that's the big secret of lime is the good mixing. I just remind people if you have uh, questions uh, for Edward, just to, to use the, the, the Q&A, there's questions starting to come in there, Catherine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, simple questions, but uh, what's the difference between hydraulic and hydrated lime, Edward? Can you explain? All limes except quick lime are hydrated. When you burn the rock, you get quick lime what's called quick lime or lump lime. And when you add water to it and it falls to a powder, you've got a hydrated lime. It goes from calcium oxide to calcium hydroxide. And you, but some of them are non-hydraulic. Hydraulic limes are limes that contain silicates or aluminates. And the best hydraulic limes are based on the silicates. And uh, it, it, they create an impurity. You see, the, the demand in the world is mainly for pure limes for industry. But while for building demanded uh, non impure limes, but hydrated limes, it's like saying just because you have a rover doesn't mean it's four wheel drive. You know, hydraulic limes are four wheel drive lime, they'll do, and you know, it's, it's a different, it contains an impurity that sets both with and underwater. Hydraulic lime means that it sets both with and underwater. Once you, once you mix a hydraulic lime, it's going to set. The degree of set will be different for different strengths. But if you mix an ordinary lime from Clogrenin, which is a very good lime, by the way, Clogrenin lime is extremely pure, good lime for its purpose, uh, it'll never set. If you left it under water in a bucket, it would never, ever set. In a thousand years, it'll still be usable, provided it's kept underwater or kept wet. While if you mix a hydraulic lime up, it'll set to some degree. It might only set as, as hard as a soft soap. But, but it will set to some degree and you cannot knock it back up again. Or what mortar would you advise for an old mill race that is now dry? An NHL5 would be, because below ground level in water conditions, an NHL5 would be the one you'd use. <clears throat> or, or clay, if it's, it can be puddling clay either, depending on the type of mill race. If it's a mill race <clears throat> that's um, just in the ground, but not built in stone, then it's a, you use a, a clay, a puddling clay. You wouldn't use a lime at all. Where can you source quick lime for mixing and slaking yourself? Well, from Clogrenin or from us, we supply it. But you, it's not wouldn't be used under normal circumstances for building. You wouldn't normally use uh, it for building purposes. Now there are a lot of people out there telling people that you can use it, and of course you can because in fact building ordinary stone walls, all, all the mortars doing is stopping them from you know, rocking, because the reality is stone wall, stone wall correctly built, dry would work. But and it depends why, on where you use them. Why you use them, Edward? Why wouldn't you I, use quick lime? Well, wait now, sorry, wait now, maybe I should have put this, which quick lime? Because you can have a hydraulic quick lime as well as a non-hydraulic quick lime. Yes, but there's no, well, we will supply people with hydraulic quick lime in bulk if they want it. But we wouldn't advise using it because it, it takes a lot more skill. Now, a non-hydraulic quick lime is very easy to use, but it, it, it will not set enough except for internal work and or very rough work. 
Okay. What mix would you recommend for a lime crete floor? A two and a half, a minimum of two and a half to one of an NHL five. Um, if it's going to uh, take traffic and be support a uh, used floor, probably two to one. But again, it depends on which of the limes you're using because no two natural hydraulic limes from two manufacturers are the same. <coughs> so it would depend, strictly speaking, on lime should, strictly speaking, a lime specification should be specific to a make of lime because they all have different characteristics. It's like going out to buy a car. Somebody says, you should buy a two-litre car. Well, you wouldn't just buy a two-litre car if you're going to pull a horse box. You'd want a four-wheel drive two-litre. Wouldn't just be, two-litre wouldn't be enough to tell you you should what to use and if you you know you know it's a high performance there are high performance and low performance all coming from the same not from the same manufacturer because but from different manufacturers because they're natural products you see they're natural hydraulic lines they're not they're not allowed the, the people who make it are not allowed to change anything except the fuel and the burning time how do you repair rising damp on internal walls First, do away with source of moisture, if at all possible. But also, whatever you do, don't plaster the outside or inside with cement, because all that to do will make the moisture rise higher, because the moisture can't get out, so therefore it rises. If you put a concrete block in water at the end of it, stand it upright, put the concrete block, the moisture will rise two or three inches. If you wrap the same block in plastic, the moisture will rise nine or ten inches, or even up to the very top of the block, depending on making the block. If you trap moisture, a, a waterproof membrane is something that turns good water into bad water. You've got to let the moisture out and prevent it getting in by using a lime plaster or a lime render on the outside, which has a resistance to water penetration, but is highly breathable. Lime is exactly the same to you as cotton or wool is to you. And cement is the nylon. I mean, well, I'm not sure you're old enough to remember the dry, drip dry nylon short. Who's wearing one now? And that's that's what nylon is, you know, because and basically hydraulic lime in its setting action forms a very dense but breathable su surface where which is resistant to water. It's like the, the mesh in a, in a cattle shed, the mesh they use to stop the rain blowing cattle shed. Unless the wind is really blowing hard against that, water won't come through it. It runs off it. It's the same with a hydraulic line, but at the same time, it acts as a breathable membrane to allow the moisture, wick the moisture back out of the thing. But it must be touching the wall. You see, we, we go to buildings and they're, they have a lime render on it, but the house is damp. We discovered the lime render is all hollow because it's not actually touching the wall to pull the moisture back out. It's like if you hang a wick into a lamp and it's not touching the oil, you won't get oil to light the wick. It has to have something to wet it to come up to, to allow it. It, it it acts like a wick and takes the water back out of the wall edward you've sold the lime mortar so well we have somebody with a garage so i'm assuming it's a it's a modern uh, block you know cement block garage and wondering do they put lime mortar on that or are we only talking about traditional buildings there's um Strictly speaking, we can give them a mortar uh, uh, with a cement and mix. If the, See, the problem with cement is that builders think if one shovel of cement is good, two is even better, three will get us out at four o'clock, four will get us out at lunchtime. You see, it's not, the cement itself isn't the problem, it's the density of the mix. And you can actually make a mix with cement and lime, which is as breathable as lime, but it hasn't done away with the salts in the cement. Now, in the concrete block, You've already got cement, it makes no difference. But you wouldn't use a cement based mortar on an old building because the cement, salts in the cement, can damage the host masonry. But the other way around, Edward, on, this, on the, the cement wall, the cement block wall, is there any yes. advantage in using lime mortar on that? Uh, well, of course, I sell it. What do you think? I would say. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is, but like, yes, no, but we have a, we have a, a HL5, which would be perfect for that. It's, it's a hydraulic um, line, a hydraulic line, not a natural hydraulic line, which has a tiny amount of cement to make it easier to use. And that's, but not for conservation, for... Yeah, yeah. but the real rest, message, yeah. 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 the clear yeah. message here this morning, and I know from dealing with farmers and advisors that everybody doesn't understand it, as Pat said, 
but the traditional buildings need lime mortar. Traditional stone buildings. That's yeah, the sure. method, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's, sure lime that's really good. I mean, um, are there it, tradi any traditional uh, building materials or techniques used in Irish buildings which are still mysteries or difficult to, to replicate? Not really. No, it, it, it's it's there's not it it, it the problem. People are so used to working with instant working materials like, uh, you know, um, Tech 7 and, 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 and uh, uh, expanding foam and everything else. It, it, it's, it, you have to take your time with line. It takes time. It's not the, it's not the cost of the line. I mean, in, in a line plastering job, the, the line itself is only about maximum 6 or 8% of the actual thing. Now, that's double what it would cost if you use cement. But it's the time, it's timing the work. You see, you can't, to do a, a line plastering job, it's four to seven days between coats, right? It's usually just one day between cement coats. By right, it should be longer, but people don't leave it that long. Four to seven days. And so you can't go in with a gang of people and do the whole building out. If you, you want to go in, you have to have another job to go to. Pat, before I come back to you, can I ask a question myself then? Yeah, As fire ahead. Of relevance to like advisors, and this was me on the ground meeting farmers, meeting, we're the ones that see all these lovely old buildings um, not used probably commercially, you know, um, not making going to make a huge amount of money. But what can we say to a farmer? Now, obviously, you mentioned the traditional farm building scheme, which was in all the agri-environment yeah. schemes and hopefully will be in the new acres. But even in the meantime, before we go, because if you go into the traditional farm building scheme, you get your professional help from, a, 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 you know, from the architect, a traditional building person. But just for in general for farmers, what can they do to help keep these buildings for the next generation? Any simple tips? Just always repair them with lime. You know, okay. and and as I said, you can't go wrong really using an NHL three point five. It's the, you know, okay. it's 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 the middle of the road line that will under normal stuff. But all they have to do is send us a, a picture of what they're doing, and we can usually tell them. Or we can, you see, we can recommend to to um, we can recommend them to we can see somebody down the road who's used the material. You see, most of our business buildings aren't public. Oh, you know, they're most of our buildings just they're privately owned and we'd have to then get permission mm -hmm. from the thing. one of the biggest enemies of the whole thing is uh is the facebook and 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 the internet you see where people in other countries where they have six times less rain are telling people you don't need yeah. you know you, you don't need it on that they, they, one then apart from the will walls we've got that message loud and clear um keeping the roof on of some sort is that important to keep the walls standing? Oh, yeah. 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 Even and if we can't afford to do the slate one today, is it really important to tell farmers to, to keep some roof on until it could be done perfectly? Oh, yeah. Is that important? Yeah. And never take, say, if you're talking about walls around gardens or ordinary walls around farmyard, never take the ivy off them until you're prepared to replace it. Because two things happen, or take, never cut... Um, something like a, an ash or a sycamore that's growing, unless you're rootlessly prepared to kill it, because the root can grow up to six or seven times in the in that growing season. And also, if you take the top off a wall, even though it might be only old, old couch grass growing on top of the wall, it protects the wall from the rain going down into it. It acts like a, like a head of hair. It'll protect some of the rain from going down. Well, I've seen walls where people clean the top off, heavy shower rain in the winter, down into the wall, frost came, literally blew the wall apart. Like you're better in a lot of cases leaving things alone unless you're actually going to do you, you have to stop that and don't don't cut anything like ivy or that unless you're ruthlessly prepared to kill it. And that's up to, they have to go to their chalkage advisor to find out what's the what's the correct uh, herb is it a herbicide? No, but herb, anyway to kill it. Because you I, I've seen in our own building, literally our own house, we worked on it to get a, a digger around to clean out the site. We had to cut an ash that was growing out at an angle of 45 degrees and we just cut it and we left it and went back about two years later. And there was a there was a crack in the wall in an outbuilding. You could put your fist into it. And that wasn't there when we read. But if we hadn't cut the ash, it was grand. But we needed to get past it. You learn by experience and 
we have a lot of experience you know of, and, of dealing with these and seeing what happens if you don't do it right pat can i just come back yeah. to the first go ahead. sorry and then I, i'll hand over to you um just in case we forget the first question related back to uh david and and the open date johnstown castle um for for advisors for private advisors just to know that it it, it will be registered as an iasis um event uh with iasis points and there will be a stand for you to to claim your points and um, so that's very important for private agricultural advisors it, it will be um an IAS event so back to you pat yeah no and it's it's it, i think i was about to ask a question uh, um uh, uh, that you were asking and i suppose through the schemes and Catherine, you have a, a, a i suppose follow, follow the the various schemes and the, and the heritage and the restoration schemes you might give people an idea of what's available now and what you expect to be available uh, in terms of support for for people to take on potential projects of of restoring uh, uh, farm buildings, am I putting you on the spot too much? I, are you asking me, or Edward? Yeah, I think. I, yeah, you know, I mean, you've a, a good. Bit yeah, of no, we're not sure yet, Pat. Um, I was just trying to find out. Even uh, and uh, there's been no mention of it for acres, but hopefully it will be. So that's all okay. we can say. Yeah, but it, more it, point I, of view. Sorry, sorry. Edward. From our point of view, like you, you know, you we 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 spend more time advising people than like if you came if you came tomorrow and sat in our office, you'd be convinced that selling lime was a license to print money. But in reality, you see, remember you have five or six contractors pricing a job, everyone will ring you, and it's the one who gets the job is that spends least time in the phone. The other people want you to practically plaster the building over the phone for them. You know, if I, so it's not, a, but we have a Vincent here, which is the other side of the computer at the moment. He's our, will be here technically to answer all the questions, our Frank. And I, I go out on site and, and visit people. That, that's my whole role. I, I have nothing to do with the day to day running of the business. I actually don't even know the price of half our products or most of our products because it doesn't concern me. I can only tell you the right thing to do. It's up to you. I can't, you know, I, I, don't, I will not go to a site to sell a product. I'm not there to sell a product because I can tell you the right thing to do. That's all I can do when I get there. Okay. And Listen, I think we're 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 hitting on our 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 time, uh, and uh, really, I think a, a lot of responses coming back from people really appreciating the talk. Found find it absolutely fascinating. It's an area I suppose we we probably underrepresent the the whole built heritage in, in our consideration of environmental issues at at, at yeah. farm level. Uh, I think it's hugely important to protect uh, uh, what we have and and I suppose to to build in in traditional manner. So really, thank you very much for for, for your contribution and I, I, the the visual element of the, the the presentation where we saw so much of the from the examples that you gave was was absolutely fascinating and I think just grabbed people's attention. So thank you very much for that, Edward. From, really from my point of view, like what I think from I think I've always said for. 20, 30 years, a friend of mine is in tourism, runs a tourist business. If you drive from Dublin to Cork, it's vernacular buildings, you see. There are very few large houses to be seen from a main road. What really gives you the correct impression of what Ireland is about are the vernacular and farmhouse buildings. And but we're being led by foreign magazines. We're not, nobody in Ireland is leading people to correct Irish buildings. Why would you want to come from a foreign country to look at a foreign house. Even Irish Georgian buildings, the correct ones, are different than English Georgian buildings. We had a different even then to the people who know. You see, like we're, we're turn, turning Ireland into a, you know, we're copying continental yeah. practice, which are our British practice. We should be, you know, showing, we have a, a style of building, which is, which people want to see. And that's, you know, you, that's why it's so important that these farms and gate and everything is are restored because they're unique to Ireland. Very good. Listen, thank you again. And just a, a, a reminder that uh, next week Catherine is turning from assistant to, to main uh, a main person in on the webinar. She'll be uh, talking about best practice for hedgerows. We're moving from I suppose Heritage Week to to Hedgerow Week. Um, which is something that that uh, Catherine has led within Chagas for the last number of years to to uh, uh, I think a lot of success in in relation to it. I think we we do now have a huge amount more focus in relation to hedge, hedgerows and 
anybody who's looking at uh, potentially joining the acre scheme, there are a number of, of measures in there for, for hedgerows, but there's also uh, for the probably the first time standards being set for the, the management of all hedgerows within within the, the, the schemes and, and, and within our requirement under, uh, under cross compliance. So I think you're going to see a much higher focus there. So uh, we'll be beginning hedgerow week with the presentation from Catherine on the management of hedgerows next week. Uh, then before I finish, I'd like to thank our production team of Andy Boland and, and Yvonne Marr, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Thank you. Edward, and bye. Thank you.